Father God, it's just so wonderful to be in your home again, Lord. Just to have had this quiet time this morning, just to spend some time with you here. It's just been amazing, Father. Lord, there's just so much to pray for, and that's everything that's happening globally today. Father, we just pray for all of those families, and there's just, there's almost everyone that has been impacted by the coronavirus, Father. But we hear such really sad stories out there. You know, where families have been torn apart as a result of this virus, Lord. We just pray for comfort and healing and for restoration, Lord. We also pray for all of those that are in need of you, Lord Jesus. And the need is just so great, O Lord. So we just pray that you'll touch them in that special way, Father God. That we'll be able to draw them close to you, Lord Jesus, as your servants and as your disciples, Father. So we ask that you'll empower us, O oh Lord Jesus. Strengthen us to go out into the world in different ways today, I think, mostly through technology right now. But to reach out to others, O oh Lord, and just to draw them close to you, Father, so that they too can experience this awesome love and this amazing grace that you continue to shower us with on a daily basis. We pray for St. Albans, we pray for all parishioners. We also think about so many people in our parish that have been affected by the virus, so many families of Lord. We ask that you touch each and every one of them. We also think of our rector Sharon as well, Father God. And we just pray that you bless each and every one and that you just touch them in that special way. We ask for complete healing. We ask for restoration. And we claim this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray for our beautiful cities, London. We pray for our country, South Africa, and we pray for the world at large, Father. We just pray, O oh Lord Jesus, that amidst all of this that is happening, O oh Lord, that there's just so much learning, Father. And we pray that through our experiences, good or bad, that we can translate all this learning into action as we come to serve you, O oh Lord. And we just pray that you make us really good ambassadors of your kingdom. And we ask this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, good morning. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. And as we listen to you, may you open up our hearts and minds to hear you. Um, the readings for today are taken from the book of De Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. Then we read Psalms 111, and then 1 Corinthians, chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. And the gospel reading is taken from the gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him. Be quiet, come out of the man, he ordered. At that the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience. And they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Saviour. And 
then the colleague for today is merciful Lord your word brings healing and life cleanse us from our sins that we may serve you with a quiet mind for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit one God in glory everlasting Amen although very different in their emphasis all four readings are about following God's law in some way or the other. The Deuteronomy text announces a new prophet that will succeed Moses. This prophet will speak the word of God and the people are warned to listen to him, failing which they will be held to account. And the appointed psalm talks about fearing God and following his precepts, following his laws and teachings in order to receive God's grace and compassion. And the 1 Corinthians passage calls on people to think about their actions as it could unwillingly cause others to sin. And the reading from the Gospel of Mark teaches us that Jesus not only taught with authority, but that he was able to translate his teaching into action as he performed his first exorcism. So although the Deuteronomy passage was to bring comfort to the people of Israel through the appointment of a new prophet that was to succeed Moses, I'm sure that many of the people felt insecure. This must have been very unsettling for them. Firstly, how would they be able to ascertain who was the, who was the genuine prophet and who were the false ones? And then also with the arrival of a new prophet, obviously, comes a lot of new teachings teachings that would challenge the way people lived and they would therefore choose not to listen. The general feeling from both Jewish and Christian people is that the prophet mentioned here is the Messiah. Peter refers to the passage in his sermon and sees this as a clear prediction of Jesus and Stephen in his speech to the Jewish council also mentions or, predicts or refers to this prediction with the wording, the righteous one. And we know the righteous one to be Jesus Christ. And in Psalm 111, the psalmist wants to draw our attention back to God's work on behalf of the, his people in Exodus. The reference to God's grace and mercy reminds us of the revelation of God's name in Exodus 34. His redemption takes us to the Exodus, his precepts to Mount Sinai, and we think of the Ten Commandments, the, prov the provision of food to the wilderness wandering, and we think of manna, and his inheritance to the promised land. The Bible is filled with many references as to who Jesus is, his life, his lordship, and what he came to do on earth. But on a more personal note, and, and on a personal note, or personal to you and I, Jesus is just so many things to us. He is our deliverer. He is our good shepherd. He is our king and king of kings. He is our hope, our way maker, our promise keeper, our redeemer and savior. And today, today we get to know Jesus as a healer with authority. In the midst of a pandemic, we continue to flout regulations. Regulations that have been formulated to protect us and to ensure our safety but we knowingly choose to make the wrong decisions, thereby impacting the lives of many people around us. Today, just over a hundred million people across the globe have contracted the coronavirus, with 2.2 million having succumbed to the virus. And the virus continues its wave of destruction. So I don't think there could be a better time to learn about Jesus as a healer, as the healing that we need right now is of global proportions. The passage from the Gospel of Mark is set in Capernaum, the hometown of Peter. Jesus had gone into the synagogue to pray, and we learn that the people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law, or the scribes did. But surely the teachers of the law had the ultimate um, spiritual authority, they had been the spiritual leaders in the community for many, many years. They had deep learning and were revered for their knowledge and wisdom. 
They were in many respects the agents of truth. So isn't that what authority is all about? So what do you think or how could Mark say that Jesus taught with so much authority and not like the scribes did? I think in order for us to understand what Mark was saying, we need to understand what is meant by authority. And in its essence, authority is the, is the right someone has or a right that an institution holds to enforce or expect obedience from others. It was this type of authority that the scribes held. They were legally qualified. They had the right to judge people. And so it was expected that the people of the law or, or that the people would obey the, teach, the teachers of the law. But there are two types of authority. There is positional authority and there is relational authority. Positional authority is where someone expects people to respect him or her because of the position that he holds. And in extreme cases, he demands this respect. In our church communities, this is sometimes made explicit. As leader of this life group, I expect you to do as I say. But more often than not, positional authority is expressed in passive aggressive behavior. There's a quiet aggressiveness of where others are made to feel inferior to the leader through demonstration of their knowledge, experience or wisdom. Positional authority can be dangerous and an ungodly thing. The exa example of Jesus Christ is the opposite of positional authority. It is the absolute denunciation of positional authority. Jesus did not cling to his own position, but became a servant instead. Jesus did not seek service for himself. Jesus aimed to serve others. Jesus did not propose to do his own will, but the will of God the Father. Jesus did not promote himself. Jesus showed himself as a servant through, through his actions. Jesus praised the character of a trusting servant. Jesus taught that humility and servanthood cannot be separated. Jesus taught his disciples that greatness is found in servanthood. So in doing all of this, Jesus acted out of relational authority, seeking to win through respect. Leaders that act out of relational authority are transparent to those they lead. Transparent about their vision, their mission, their goals, objectives. Transparent about their own failings and shortcomings. Seeking to minister out of the respect that has been earned. And as Paul says of Jesus in Philippians 2, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness, he humbled himself. And make no mistake, leaders who act out of relational authority are very strong leaders. You see, most of us are more attracted to relational leaders than positional leaders because, because we recognize in them a deep humanity that allows us to be human too. And so when Mark says, Jesus taught them as one having authority, it is a reflection of his relational authority, that he was humble and deeply human and was allowing people to meet him in their humanity too. And because they become so used to people leading out of positional authority, we read in verse 22, that they were astounded at Jesus' teaching. This notion of amazement is a strong word. It has the connotation of putting people into shock or panic. Such was the strength and power of relational authority. The likes of this had not been seen before. The teaching was so good that the unclean man, who would normally have drawn a lot of attention, wasn't even noticed, as everyone's attention was fixed on Jesus. It was only when Jesus responded to the unclean man that the attention was slightly averted but with a focus still being on Jesus. And so, we are not surprised that even the evil spirits went into panic and shock. But it's much deeper than this. The unclean spirit confesses a deep understanding of who Jesus is. He understands the power that Jesus has or possesses. Have you come to destroy us, he says. And he also reveals that Jesus is the Holy One of God, the divinity of Christ. 
So what is interesting here, of course, is that even an evil spirit knew who Jesus was. But the religious leaders of the law had not quite worked it out for themselves. How ironic that the holy men should have missed the truth in their midst, and yet the unclean should recognize Jesus for who he was. But even though the unclean spirit knew who Jesus was, it refused to submit to his authority. And of course, the call on us as Christians is not just to know who Jesus is, but it is to submit our lives to his authority and power. Not just Jesus of Nazareth, not just Jesus the Son of Man, not just Jesus the Light of the World, and not just Jesus the Holy One of God, but Jesus my Lord and my Savior. And it is, be and it is because the evil spirit would not sit under the Lordship of Christ, that Jesus commands him to be quiet. In verse 34, we learn that Jesus drove out many demons, but he would not allow them to speak because they knew who he was. After healing a leper in verses 41 to 42, Jesus warns him not to disclose this to anyone. I think Jesus did this because he didn't want people to follow him because of the miracles he performed. That would be superficial. I don't think Jesus wanted um, people to follow him because of all the things that he did. I think Jesus wants us to follow him because we accept him as our Lord, Lord over our lives, submitting totally to Jesus and giving Jesus all the power of authority. I also think that Jesus didn't want the word to spread too much because Jesus had a certain mandate to, to fulfill. His time on earth was limited and he knew exactly what needed to be done. So if certain areas were exposed or knew of Jesus upon his arrival, he would not be able to do the things that he was supposed to do. You see, Jesus had a lot of teaching to do on, on the earth, so that when he left, we would know exactly how to live our lives. You see, Jesus is not interested in, in academic acknowledgement of who he is. Jesus doesn't want us to speak about him purely from our knowledge. Jesus doesn't want to be followed because of the position that he holds or his positional authority. Jesus doesn't want us to follow him because of the miracles he performs. And Jesus doesn't want to enforce his lordship upon us. Jesus wants us to speak about him from a position of us accepting his lordship, of, of us accepting him as lord and saviour of our lives. So you see, it's so easy to get caught up in academic debates about God. Whether he created the world in six days or through evolution, whether Christianity is the only way to heaven or all religions are equal, whether Jesus was fully God or that he was just a good man. And there's a time and a place for all of these questions. But the ultimate question is whether or not we are prepared to sit under his lordship and give our lives over to him as disciples of his kingdom. An, an intellectual belief in Jesus is worthless. In James chapter 2 verse 17 we read, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Even demons believe that there is one God in shudder. The issue is, how much authority Jesus has in our lives. And so to prove his authority, Jesus heals the man and drives out the unclean spirit. By this exorcism, he proved his authority over Satan and the uncleanness of the world. And Mark concludes this passage by saying, at once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The gospel the good news of Jesus Christ began to spread because of word and deed. You see, the timing and unfolding of events in this passage is crucial. Jesus not only teaches with authority, but immediately thereafter demonstrates his, his, his authority by sternly instructing the evil spirit to come out of the man's body. When Jesus called out the demon, he didn't call out the man, he called out the spirit. And we are called to do the same. We must learn to love the person, but not the behavior. 
We have all displayed unlovable behaviors. But as Christians, we seek for forgiveness. The, the miracle of casting out demons demonstrates that God loves us, even if He does not love what we are doing. Jesus sets people free. Jesus heals and wants us to love others as He loves us. And Jesus wants us to move over from being the patient to being the physician. For too long we have settled into being the terminal patient, yet we are persistently being called to being the physician. Jesus needs the hands out there in the world. Having weathered life storms through the grace of, of, of Jesus, we are called to share our experiences, to translate all our learning gained into action as we go out there and minister to others less fortunate, thereby healing them. And it's in this way that we become the physician. Folks, we have been the patient for too long. Jesus was always clear in his teaching. Don't just listen to what I'm saying. Obey my teaching. And I think obeying calls for action. It requires doing and not just listening. So the same Spirit of God that dwelled in Jesus to empower him to heal the unclean man is the same Spirit of God that dwells in you and I. It is the same Spirit of God that dwelled in the prophet Elijah and it is the same spirit that if we let it, will lead us to heal, just like Jesus did. And in closing, I would like to refer you to James chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. And is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness is brought with the precious blood of Jesus joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen.